Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this gorgeous day. Um, welcome on behalf of both the Tredifferin Public Library and the Tredifferin Easttown Historical Society. Um, the Historical Society is, uh, depends on membership for our continued existence and for people to share information with us. And we hope you will join us, um, not just for programs, but join the group to help preserve history in Tredifferin Township. Um, this is our last fall program. Um, stay tuned, we will have more programs coming in the spring. We're still working on what exactly they are and what the dates are, but um, we do hope you will join us. And um, I'm gonna pass this on to Bart Van Valkenburg, who will be talking about amazing stories of mainline veterans. Bart? Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm gonna kind of give this presentation uh, rhetorically, because I can't see in things like that, but as we go through it, um, we'll come up with some questions and answers towards the end, and Marianne will help me with that. Um, what we're looking at today is Veterans Day, and that originally started was um, Armistice Day after November 11th in 1918, the end of fighting in World War I. And this day is more to celebrate the veteran, where Memorial Day, um, in May is to celebrate the um, soldiers and sailors and Marines and Air Force people we've lost. Um, so let, let's um, begin and rock and roll a little bit. It all starts out when a, a person gets to the decision where they want to join the armed forces. And you get these uh, dog tags and you raise your right hand and you swear to defend the Constitution. Um, I saw a cartoon the other day on the dog tags. They're, they're made of metal, M-E-T-A-L, and the cartoons jokingly saying they are um, metals of honor. And that, that's kind of a neat thing because we all wore them um, locally around the homesteads and the neighborhoods and the towns. You'll have monuments and memorials to the veterans um, where people remember people and um, they give thanks. In, in Berwyn, there's a great group, the Berwyn um, Veterans Memorial. Um, they have a big location down in Wilson Park where they have billboards uh, with all the veterans' names on it. And, and that's such a nice thing in the various wars and, and um, uh, military events that they served in. Another really fine place, um, our friend John Sr. discovered this in his church, and um, this is a beautiful uh, reminder of um, what the local church people did. It's a handmade, hand-lettered World War II list of the parishioners that went off to fight the wars, and um, in it, it has um, the stars on the uh, soldiers and sailors that didn't come home. And along with this in the church, they have a booklet that you can go in and look up each one of the uh, people's names and uh, get a little background on them. And that, that's kind of what we do for Veterans Day is, is trying to salute and support. In Pennsylvania, there's um, almost 850,000 vets um, living in the state. And that's 8.3% uh, 8, 8 of the population. In Chester County, we've got 26,000 veterans, and I've seen the number as high as 28,000. Um, so there's a lot of vets in our neighborhoods. The veterans are supported over the years by their, their various veterans organizations. This is one of the oldest, and of course, there's no more Civil War soldiers left. Uh, the Grand Army of the Republic, that was one of the first veterans groups. Um, after World War I and World War II, these two big groups um, uh, established themselves, the VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and the American Legion. And they, they worked really hard as um, two veterans groups that would help um, the neighborhood, help the individual veterans, and develop community awareness of veterans. Uh, after Vietnam, the Vietnam Veterans Group popped up, and they were instrumental in the Agent Orange fight and, and helping the Vietnam vets. 
And that's the largest group of veterans in the state and in the country right now. But there's, there's a whole new group, the Iraq Afghanistan, um, that organizations, and they're fighting a lot of the uh, chemical diseases and things and the mental stress that um, the vets that were in the, in the Eastern Wars are up to, the pollution from um, burning dumps and, and the uh, stress that they're under, PTSD and things. So these organizations are critical to um, support the veteran community. In, in doing research, what I tried to do was find some interesting um, American service people. And this is the most original one I could find. Sergeant Andrew Wallace, he lived to be 105 years old. And I discovered him when I was doing research on the Green Tree Inn and the Pale Inn, because what he would do as an old veteran is go and visit the inns at night and talk with the the patrons, the travelers that would stay there and trade these cards for drinks and tips. Um, and he'd tell his war stories. So when he was 16 year old, he fought in the battle at Culloden, Scotland, which was between the Stuarts and King George II. So, so this, this gentleman is, is fighting in 1746. And he died in 1835. He came to America in 1752 at 22 years old. And then they fought in the French and Indian Wars out in the western part of Pennsylvania in 1754. And these, these dates are just incredible. And, and he's, he's not even started his military career yet. During the Red War, he began at, at 46 and he ended it when he was 51 years old. And he was involved in the Three Rivers Battle in Canada, and then at Brandywine and Paoli. And at Brandywine, um, he was a sergeant, and there was this new general named um, the Marquis de Lafayette, who was wounded, severely wounded in the leg. And didn't um, Sergeant Andrew Wallace pick up and carry him off the battlefield and take him to a farmhouse a mile or two away to get aid? So he's directly responsible for Lafayette um, surviving and going on. And then um, Andrew Wallace was at Paoli, the uh, oldest living survivor of Paoli. And he tells the story that at that night battle, he hid in a little stand of chestnut trees, little small chestnut trees. And when he take the uh, veterans back 30, 40, 50 years later to the battle for ceremonies, he would show these giant chestnut streets where he hid. And he was at Germantown Valley Forge, Monmouth, and then fought at Stony Point with Wayne again, General Anthony Wayne, then went down south, involved in Cam Camden, Utah, Calpins, and finally at Yorktown. Pretty good career. You're 51 years old. You think you'd give up then. Nope. He went out to the Ohio Indian Wars in the 1790s. And you think he'd hang it up then? Nope. He went to the war 1812 and was in New Orleans and he was finally discharged at 83 years old. And then he kept going around and making his living selling these cards and telling war stories in the tavern and having lots of kids. Um, here's a newspaper ad uh, for Andrew where he was uh, becoming the cause to celebrity and he'd go to Baltimore and New York and things and um, host a ton of people that would come and, and uh, hear stories at 105. And, and here's when he was in New York, he um, actually died there and he was buried in um, St. Patrick's Cathedral um, and they opened the Bishop, um, Bishop Connolly's grave, his tomb, and they buried Andrew beside him because he was a Mason and all these other really cool things. But, Sergeant Andrew Wallace, our oldest vet that I've found. Then there's um, nicknames, and the nicknames are, are fabulous parts of the story. You get Old Gimlet Eye, and um, I, I looked up what Old Gimlet Eye or what a Gimlet Eye would be. That's somebody who had a steely, steely look that he'd look you in the eyes and they might be bloodshot and everything, and you'd look back and like, whoa, this guy's serious. So here's Old Gimlet Eye. 
local boy made good. Smedley Darlington Butler, born in Westchester, a Quaker family. Um, and he, he uh, eventually settled later on in his career in Newtown Square. And he lived right off of um, Goshen Road between uh, 252 and um, Earl's Lane. And the, the house was purchased a couple years ago and in, in kind of disrepair and a couple that bought it, restored it, turned it into a beautiful facility. But um, kind of an honor to Smedley. He uh, first got in the Spanish-American War in Cuba, then wound out a year later going into the insurrection between the Americans and the Philippines, and then the Boxer Rebellion. But while he was in the Philippines, he got a, a tattoo of the Marine Corps uh, Eagle Globe and Anchor. And um, the tattoo started at his neck and ended at his waist. So here, here's a man that has serious Marine feelings. And if you've ever met a Marine, uh, you know they're dead serious about the Corps. So that's old Smedley. Um, there's a picture here. Um, this picture was um, in Veracruz uh, in 1914. And there's Smedley there. And right beside him is his general, uh, John Lejeune of the Camp Lejeune fame. Smedley went up in the Central American campaigns and in Veracruz in 1914, he was awarded the Medal of Honor uh, for his heroism in leading troops in battle. And um, it's usually, you know, a soldier will do something like that once, but the following year he was in Haiti in 1915 and he was awarded the second Medal of Honor. And he got many other, other decorations and he was the most decorated Marine up until um, World War II when um, uh, Chesty Fuller took over. Um, here's a World War I picture of Smedley, his Brigadier General. He had no combat um, duty in Europe, in France, but what he did do was the American camp was um, putrid and, and really bad sanitation and everything. And Smedley went in there and turned it around and cleaned it up and stopped all kinds of problems and issues because he knew how to make things work. He took a leave of absence after World War I from the Marines and he became the director of public safety for Philadelphia. And um, day one, he started busting all the uh, speakeasies and everything. Didn't make a lot of people happy, but he was dead serious about what he was doing. Then went back in the Marine Corps and he was looked at to become the head of the Marine Corps as a major general, but there were some political uh, relations he had with people like Herbert Hoover and stuff that didn't go well. So he retired in 1931. Uh, there's a great photograph of the general. Um, they named a Marine Corps base after him in Okinawa, Camp Smedley D. Butler. Smedley Darlington Butler. And another honor he was given, they uh, built a destroyer in World War II and named it after him. So old Gimli was quite, quite a Marine, the Marine's Marine, especially with that tattoo. Here's one that's kind of near and dear, two different East Town Historic Society and the Conestoga students is S. Paul Teamer, Samuel Paul Teamer. He's a, a Malvern family, born in Malvern, um, and he's buried in the Baptist Church in Malvern. He graduated from the very first class of Tredifer East Town High School in 1909, then went to Bucknell, played football, and after graduating Bucknell, he came back to T.E. High and was the principal and football coach for, for many years and a history teacher. And the photograph in the lower right has uh, uh, Paul Teamer standing by Sia Monument at Valley Forge Park, leading the history groups. In World War I, he left the school and went to France as a lieutenant in the 79th Division, 311th Field Artillery, in the American Expeditionary Force. And when he was there, he had a problem with some kind of an infection or issues, and it affected his legs. And that, that um, 
really cause problems with his life later on. The picture in the uh, lower right, you can see he has a, a walking stick. And I said in 1936, he helped found the Tredyffrin Easttown History Club, which has evolved to be our group now, the Tredyffrin Easttown Historic Society. Uh, he was also one of the directors of the Chester County Historical Society. And in 1940, he had operation on his leg and it um, led to complications and he passed away. And the football field at Conestoga, Teamer Field, is named after him uh, because he was such a great principal and football leader and an uh, all-around guy. There's a sad thing going on right now. Here's, here's uh, Paul Teamer's grave in the Baptist Church in Melbourne. And we discovered uh, recently in the last year or two that it was vandalized and knocked over. And hopefully, maybe by Veterans Day, if not by the end of the month, a um, couple of my colleagues, uh, Sue Corey, the Vice President of uh, Paley Battlefield Preservation Fund and a graduate of Conestoga and Gene Howe, uh, who we know well with um, his history of grave register, uh, restoration and things. We're going to get that stone upright uh, back to where it belongs. And both he and his wife beside him, um, Mildred Brown Teamer, are going to get cleaned up and set to go. But that, that's just one of the little things that you do for vets that, that matter. Now, here, here's a good one. Which is another nickname? You got Tui or Hap? Hey, Tui. <laughs> hey, Hap. Um, these two guys were buddies. And um, they worked together in the military. And we'll start with Hap, because he's the older of the two. Uh, there's a picture of Hap when he was about uh, 13 or 14. And he was born in Gladwin down Lower Marion in uh, 1886. And he passed away in 1950. Henry Harley Arnold. Picture of him uh, when he gets out of Lower Marion, 1903. Good looking guy. Nice hat. I like a sporty outfit. Um, he was in the military after he graduated West Point, and the Wright brothers taught him how to fly. And he got the Federation Aeronautic International Pilot License number 29. So he's like the 29th guy in the world to get a pilot's license. And he's still in, in the uh, military, in the army. And during the 20s to the 40s, the military was developing aircraft and organizations and, and uh, a lot of growth, a lot of schooling, a lot of education. In World War II, after all of this education and stuff, Hap wound up being in charge of all United States Army Air Corps globally, five-star general. He had uh, five heart attacks during the war years and just after the war, put a lot of pressure on him, um, made it difficult. Uh, this is a great photograph just to kind of give you an idea of um, getting a seat at the table. You have General Arnold on the left, say, seated. Beside him is Admiral King. So that's the head of the Air Force and the head of the Navy. And then Winston Churchill, Franklin D. Roosevelt. The guy with the glasses and mustache is a British bloke. And then on the very right is uh, George C. Marshall. So um, Hap was right at the table, making the decisions and things to lead the war effort. When Hap um, left the Air Force, he was replaced by his buddy, Tui. And Hap and Tui were in that 1920s, 1940s developmental um, program where they we learn how to do things and figure it out. When, when um, Arnold retired from the military, he created the RAND think tank, the RAND Corporation. And the idea was to have a, a group of people that would try to put everything together and make sense of things because he realized how trying to get the Americans and the military into the war and through the war um, was difficult because nobody thought about it. So the RAND Corporation still exists today. And it was all a direct result of Hap Arnold's um, concept. Barry Arlington 
when he passed away in 1950. Uh, Arnold Field at Lower Marion High School, the football field. Just like uh, has Paul Tinker, they named the football field for Hap, Arnold Field. Now we got Tui. Tui's a little bit geographically out of our area, but not by much. His name Carl Andrew Spots. And he was born in Boyertown, right off Route 100. And he died in 1974 and is buried at the Air Force Academy because he was the number two leader of the Air Force. Graduated West Point in 1914, learned how to fly. So it was that Army Air Corps developing, much like Hap Arnold. Here's a picture of Tui in the war. Towards the end of the war, he got into aerial combat. He had one kill, and then a couple weeks later, he had two kills in one day. And on the way back to the uh, airfield, he crashed his own plane. So had an interesting, uh, they were picking on him about that. Now this, this is really cool. The airplane in the bottom of the photograph is called the question mark. And in um, um, 1929, uh, he was a major and he put together this program to do aerial refueling and food supplies. And he's in the lower plane and they were able to stay aloft for six days, 150 hours, which is a record. And, and they'd send food down the line and, and fuel. And during one of the refueling, the uh, hose came disconnected and sprayed him with gasoline. And he stripped himself of clothes and um, they wiped him down with oil to get all this uh, noxious gasoline off him and zinc oxide. Uh, and he, he had his parachute on and the next refueling load, he was st stripped down to physically no clothes and a parachute to make sure it worked. So these, these guys were serious. This is a cool picture. Um, and I really like this one. And I'm gonna blow it up a little bit. Um, there's, as a two-star general, notice the hat. That's the way an army aviator would wear their hat. Those, those saucer caps normally had like an expansion ring that would hold the top of the hat out real sharp and, and uh, cool. But if you're flying a plane and you got the headset on, it's supposed to crush your cap. So all the military aviators have that crushed cap appearance. And Tui, Tui is uh, looking good. Uh, this is another photograph. Um, on the on the left is Dwight Eisenhower, and then Tui, and on the right is uh, uh, Jimmy Doolittle. And Tui, at this point, was made the commander of the Air Force in Europe, and he had been the commander of just one of the groups, and Doolittle was promoted to replace him. He was enough of a uh, military celebrity to be on Time and Life magazine. There's a picture of um, uh, Tui and Hap together. Two great guys. Tui Spots and Hap Arnold. Um, there's the general when he retired in 1948. And another cool picture here, the little one on the left, there's uh, three gentlemen, three generals. And you have Hap Arnold on the left, Tui Spots. And then the guy on the right is um, Hoyt Vandenberg. Uh, they named Vandenberg Air Force Base after him. That Hap was the first commander of the Air Force. Uh, Tui was the second, and um, and uh, Vandenberg um, replaced him. So these guys were um, very interesting, and they couldn't find a football field for Hap. They were they were scratching their head. Where can we find a football field? Well, instead they named the Reading Airport after Hap. So it's the uh, Reading Municipal Airport, the Carl Andrew Spots Field. Pretty neat. Now this this guy, I, I, I learned about Nappy when I was in junior high school because I went to school with his son. And he did an incredible thing one day in Italy and a general said, Nappy, a one-man army. That's what you are. You're a one-man army. Alton W. Knappenberger, uh, born in 1923, passed away in 2008. He was born in the Coopersburg area. And um, 
attended school and graduated fifth grade, and that was about it. Um, the reason I put him in here is because he lived in Balakinid when I went to school with his son. He's one of eight kids. In the, in the uh, teenage years, going into the depression and stuff, they uh, farmed and, and uh, hunted, and it was, it was hard scrabble life. 1943, he was drafted, five foot six inches tall, 118 pounds, kind of a runt. His 11th day of combat, he got in a two and a half hour firefight with his Browning automatic rifle, which you see the picture of it. And he was on a little hilltop and the Germans are firing at him with machine guns and throwing hand grenades at him and um, anti-aircraft weapons and stuff. And he's by himself. The 200 men in his, his uh, company are gone. Most of them are, are killed or wounded. So he, he keeps running out of ammunition and going over to the wounded guys and the other bodies and reloading climbing back up on the hilltop and keeps firing. His son told me when I was in, in uh, junior high, he said, yeah, my dad tells the story. He got lost. And on his way back, he killed 60 Germans. Um, just a, a, was awarded a Medal of Honor for that. Uh, before, just as the battle's over, he's, he's going back and he finds six other guys out of the 200 men in his unit. And they, they couldn't believe what he did. Uh, here's a picture of um, Nappy getting his Medal of Honor award. And on the picture on the right, the tall guy is General Mark Clark. And you see how short Nappy is, uh, the arrow I pointed on. Just a little guy with a giant heart, 11 days in combat. And when you receive an award like a Medal of Honor, a lot of times they pull the soldier out of the field and send him home for war bond drives. And the picture in the lower right Snappy and his mom when he came home. She said, what are you doing home? Um, <laughs> and then when he was a, in the States doing the war bond drives and everything, um, there's a bunch of neat newspaper articles. And he said he was in Washington with a couple officers who were their, his handler. And he says, I gave him the slip. And I went home. <laughs> Just that 1930s um, dialogue. It gave him the slip. Um, when he got out of the army, he was a staff sergeant. And you remember, he only had a fifth grade education. And he worked in paving and would drive trucks and stuff in the paving business. Um, and he raised uh, children, three wives. Um, and he lived the remainder of his life in Montgomery County and Bucks County and was um, reluctant to be a hero and be interviewed because most of these Medal of Honor awardees are, are just quiet, simple people. Uh, he's buried in Arlington. And Nappy is one of the best, just a, a nice, simple guy. Everybody's grandpa, five foot six. Um, just a great American. Really cool. I love that guy. Here's another, just a normal, normal guy. David C. Dolby from Oaks. Um, he had an interesting military career. In 1966, he was in the 1st Cavalry Division and up in the Central Highlands. And he was awarded a Medal of Honor for a four and a half hour uh, battle he was in. His uh, company platoon walked into a uh, North Vietnamese Viet Cong bunker complex. Then immediately several of the guys were killed. His lieutenant was trying to um, lead the combat group. He got wounded. And then uh, the lieutenant was severely wounded and dying. And he says to Dolby, who at this point was a spec four, specialist fourth class, a corporal, said, you're in charge now, take over. And Dolby took over. And a combination of machine gunning, uh, smoke grenades, uh, airstrikes, uh, carrying wounded guys out. He did all that for four and a half hours. Uh, here's uh, Lyndon Johnson awarding the Medal of Honor to Dolby. He did five tours in Vietnam. Five. Five tours. He said that's where the action is. 
he was awarded the Medal of Honor in his first tour. And generally, like I said, they pull um, those famous soldiers, those heroic soldiers out and give them safer duty, but not Dolby. He was also awarded the Silver Star, the third highest award for valor, and a Bronze Star, and a second Bronze Star, and a third Bronze Star, and a Purple Heart, also Air Medal and a couple others. Just a common man. He finally gets out of the army and comes back and did a very job. He had some landscaping uh, work with his brother's company. Um, he worked at the uh, Oaks BF Goodrich Tire Plant. And he probably got into an even bigger fight than he did with the North Vietnamese. The Freedoms Foundation in Valley Forge was formed in the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, E.F. Hutton, Omar Bradley and a bunch of others uh, built this organization uh, and they had 50 acres of woodland and it was called the Medal of Honor Grove. And each state had an acre with an obelisk and um, all the names of the Medal of Honor winners from each individual state. And it's rolling hill woodland. And it got in really bad repair. It was all overgrown. You can go back in there. And that incensed David. And he got together with a bunch of people, including our own Andy Dinneman. Uh, you might remember about uh, 12, 14 years ago. Um, and the Freedoms Foundation was talking about selling the property for a housing development. And Dolby led the charge and went in there and cleaned up the grove. And now it's this beautiful um, wooded land with uh, asphalt roadways and paths and benches in each state and uh, Puerto Rico and Guam has a place for their Medal of Honor recipients to be remembered and that was Dave's second battle and he did really great. Then we got General Storm and Norman Schwerkoff. Hey, how about him? Uh, born in Trenton. His father was the superintendent of the New Jersey State Police but before that, he was in the military. Uh, Norman spent time in Iran and Europe as a boy, education. But um, as you may remember, he's a Valley Forge military grad, academy grad, 1952. Got out of West Point in 56. And he did two Vietnam tours leading from the front. The uh, picture in the lower right is um, Norman leading. He led a battalion of um, South Vietnamese troops. So he wasn't leading American soldiers. He was a, uh, an advisor and right out from the front. You can see he's carrying a wounded guy back. And then the picture below his West Point uh, has General Westmoreland and um, Norman standing there. Uh, he really, really cut his teeth in that area. Got three silver stars, two bronze stars, two purple hearts, and he led from the front. And that's the key. If, if you're going to be a, a military leader, you eat last. And if you tell the guys, your men to go do a, a attack a hill, you're in the front. And if you're not, they won't follow you. Then there was Granada after Vietnam. And what uh, Schwarzkopf noted is what a mess Granada was. Uh, between the Air Force, the Navy, the Marines, and the Army, there was no communication. Nothing worked together a um, Marine general or colonel or somebody told the Army people, uh, we won't fly your soldiers on our Marine helicopters. They're not Marines. And, and uh, Schwarzkopf saw how messed up this was. And these periods in between military conflicts, these soldiers would go to college and study and learn all kinds of fabulous things to be able to be managers and leaders. And along comes Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And uh, General Schwarzkopf knew what to do from the lessons learned out of Granada. And you wouldn't want to mess with this guy. I said, leading from the front, here he is with his soldiers in um, Iraq. And they're just, they're loving them. They're just smiling from ear to ear because he was, he, they, they trusted him. He retired in 91. Uh, did a lot of um, business stuff and advisor, died in 2012, and his um, cremains are buried beside his dad at West Point. Oh, 
That's not Norman, that's Chris Farley on Saturday Night Live, imitating Storm and Norman. Um, there he is. There's the general. Amazing guy. Now we have um, a local guy, another nickname. This is the Gremlin. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to give you all the information on the Gremlin because I want you to try and figure out who it is. He was born in 24, died in 1975, happens to be an African American. In World War II, he tried to enlist in the Army and the Navy, and they both said no because you, um, you're, you're not physically fit. You had a problem with your, your neck. Uh, the Coast Guard said, sure, we'll take it. So he wound up joining the Coast Guard. In 1944, he's in the South Pacific, and there's a Japanese torpedo attack on his ship, and um, it hits, and one of his shipmates is on fire, and the gremlin runs over and puts the fire out and gets burned, trying to save the guy, and does save the guy. So here he is in the South Pacific. Two years later, he's in Newfoundland, just the opposite direction. And instead of hot and humid, it's 34 degrees. And a shipmate fell off the ship and he's um, floundering in 34 degree water. And the gremlin jumps in and saves him. He was awarded the silver life-saving medal from the Coast Guard, which is one of their high valor awards. And um, trying, to, trying to make things happen. So anybody have any ideas who it is? Uh, um, throw it out. He needed a job because he was going to college after the war, didn't have any money. And he goes up to New York and goes to the New York Giants and says, hey, can I play on your football team? And the Giants said, yeah, we'll give you a tryout and why not? And here we go. Emlyn Tunnell, Garrett Hill's own first uh, African-American played for the New York Giants. He's like the second or third African America playing in the modern day NFL. Uh, you got to remember this is this is only a year after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball. And um, Tanell was not just a good football player; he was great football player. Between um, 48 and 1958, all pro six times, eight Pro Bowls. I love these cards with that the pose. Um, just an amazing athlete. And there was a coach from the Giants who went out to Green Bay and took the head coaching job there, a guy named Vince Lombardi. One of the very first moves Lombardi made was to buy the rights to um, Emlyn Tunnell and brought him to the Packers. And in the three years with the Packers, he wound up um, as NFL champion. He was a, uh, a, a defensive back, a safety, um, just a just a fabulous football player, and it it reflected on what he did in the Coast Guard. He was a leader. On uh, 1967, he was elected to the Pro Football Football Hall of Fame, first African American to go to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That's a milestone. Um, you know, we talk about glass ceilings. He really busted that one. In 2010, um, one of the groups tried to come up with the 100 greatest NFL players in history, and he was number 70. Um, the Coast Guard is building a Coast Guard cutter, and it's supposed to be launched this year, and it's going to be named after him, the United States Coast Guard cutter, Emlyn Tunnell. And here's a statue that was recently done, and it's at the Delaware County Sports Hall of Fame down to Radnor, down near the police station, police department, off of Ivan Avenue. And it just, it's, it's such a respectful thing to a, a local son who was a great veteran and an even greater football player. Now this, I guarantee it, unless you play ice hockey, you've never heard of Hobie. <laughs> guarantee. Hobie. Hobart Armory Hare Baker, kid from Balakinley. Born in 1892, died in 1918. He played ice hockey. Um, I said he was born in Balakinwood. He was a, a, from a privileged family. His uncle and I believe his father had gone to Princeton 
and they sent him to St. Paul's private school in New Hampshire. And everything he ever did in sports, there was no effort at all. He always, always was a leader, um, easy at whatever. Um, he wound up going to Princeton and played football and hockey. The second year he's there, the football team won the national championship and he was the leader. And, and they cheer him on the field and he never wore a helmet. There's a picture of him in his ice hockey but with his football helmet look. In 1914, they won the national championship in, in ice hockey. It's said that um, the approximate number they're guessing is 120 goals scored and 100 assists in his three years at Princeton. Graduated Princeton and went to work in the finance business in New York, investments, and his, his sports drive. He played amateur hockey, played polo, dabbled in auto racing. The Montreal Canadiens off, offered him a contract to play hockey for them. And um, he turned it down because he said, you're not supposed to do sports for money. Um, because he was so interested in things in the middle teens, he learned how to fly and wound up becoming a reserve military aviator. And that, that group of people in the finance departments and stuff in um, New York was the uh, kind of who's who socially. Um, so he, he got to uh, hang out with the higher echelons there and got into the flying. In 1917, he wound up going to France, uh, joined the 103rd Aero Squadron, uh, wound up becoming the uh, command of his own squadron. And what was kind of interesting, he paint, had all the planes painted in this squadron, black and orange, with the Princeton Tiger on the fuselage, because that, that was his college colors. There he is. Um, and he was another one of these natural born leaders. And these photos, when I was studying Hobie, you look into his eyes and it's like, man, this guy is something. Uh, the war was over on November 11th, 1918. And he had orders sending him home. On December 21st, he was testing one of his comrades pay, uh, planes and it crashed and he was killed in the crash. And he had his orders in his pocket sending him home. When they uh, established the Hockey Hall of Fame in 1949, he was one of the first selected for that group. He wound up being in the United States Hockey Hall of Fame in 1973, the College Football Hall of Fame in 1975, and an award was created for the most outstanding college hockey player every year. Um, it's the Heisman of ice hockey the Hobie Baker Memorial Award. And the Princeton Hockey Rink is the Hobie Baker Memorial Rink. And it's just, um, this guy was amazing. Here's his uh, grave. He's, his mother had his body brought back um, from France and it's at West Laurel Hill. Um, and if you look down on the uh, supporting stone, those are hockey pucks. So to this day, um, college hockey players and people in the know in hockey come and pay homage to Hobie's um, uh, life and, and career. Pretty cool guy, Hobie Baker. And uh, look at those eyes. I mean, they just drill right into you. Um, F. F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, really admired Hobie. And in a couple of his novels, the characters were based after Hobie. Um, incredible guy. Now we have Pete, another local nut boy, not local nut man. Hey, Pete. Yo, Pete. <laughs> Born in Philadelphia, 1930. Went to Haverford School. When he was a teenager, he wanted to fly airplanes. And he, he got um, uh, flying lessons and learned to fly went to Princeton. And after he graduated Princeton, he joined the US Navy. Uh, he raised cars as a hobby. There's a picture of him with a Porsche at Daytona. It's probably 1971, 70 maybe. Um, and he, he supposedly had an incredible sense of humor. 
you can see like this. Here's a picture of them um, clowning around. <laughs> Oh, he joined NASA in uh, 1962. 1962, that's a, you got the Mer Mercury astronauts. Charles P. Conrad. Uh, when he learned to fly, was at the mainline airport out in Paoli, where he swapped cleaning up and cutting grass and everything for flying lessons. And that, that launched him. Um, just an uh, amazing guy. He, he was involved with Gemini 5, Gemini 11, and Skylab 2. The picture of uh, Pete and Gordon Cooper. You remember that uh, Pete's NASA group was the second bunch of astronauts. You had the Mercury 7, and then the second group. And patches for every flight were needed. Um, Gemini 5 was eight days to see if we could go to the moon and back, if man could survive. And then uh, Apollo 13. Pete was the third man on the moon, the third man on the moon. And he was quoted, um, if you remember, um, uh, Neil Armstrong said one uh, giant leap, uh, leap for mankind, and he landed on the Sea of Tranquility. Well, Pete, as his, his choking would be, first words out of his mouth is, whoopee! Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me because Pete was short. Um, just just uh, his sense of humor. He's also said that um, he uh, took a stool sample for the doctors and, and wrapped it up in a box with a ribbon. <laughs> the Apollo 12 patch. Um, I just love that with the uh, ship. Really cool. Conrad, Gordon, and, and uh, Bean. The um, picture here. This is on that, that um, Apollo 12 flight. I had completely forgotten this, but Pete is standing here beside Surveyor 3, and up in the um, upper right-hand corner is the lunar lander. They landed close enough, and um, the um, ocean of storms is where they landed, and you know, like the Sea of Tranquility. Pete called it Pete's parking lot. <laughs> so they walked all the way down there and they salvaged a bunch of equipment off the uh, surveyor that had been there for quite a while. Uh, they got television cameras and things like that to bring back and see the effect. Um, his, his humor, I mentioned a couple of those. Um, he said that Gemini 5 was a flying garbage can because he and Cooper were in it for um, eight days and it was full of all their, their junk. Um, he just, just was a character. Uh, he died in a motorcycle accident way too early, uh, long after he retired NASA. Um, his grave is in Arlington. And there's, there's our, our own Charles P. Conrad. Great photograph. Another one. Here we go. This nickname is Guy. Guy and S. Bluford. Just a regular guy. Went to Overbrook High, graduated in 1960. He flew um, F 4s in Vietnam, 144 combat missions. Um, 60 some of them were over North Vietnam. So he was uh, pretty competent in the uh, Air Force. Joined NASA in 1978 after getting out of the service. In 1983, he flew on the Challenger, the first African American in space. Here's a picture of um, the three African Americans there, uh, guys in the middle. Um, and uh, Fred Gregory's on the right. But Ron McNair is on the left, and McNair, unfortunately, was killed in the Challenger um, disaster. And um, uh, Fred Gregory went on to fly a couple other three space flights in the, in the shuttle program. Guy flew four, retired from the Air Force in 93, uh, executive in the aerospace industry and consulting. Just um, look at that smile. 
now this is this is our last candidate and maybe the most um, uh, controversial Alexander Hank was born in Isle Kinwood and he attended St. Joe's prep but um, they didn't renew his academic because his grades weren't enough so he had to switch to Lower Marion High School and he and my aunt uh, were in high school together and um, she would always talk about things that Al Hang did. Um, he wasn't good enough to get into West Point when he graduated Lower Marion, so went to Notre Dame, got his grades up, and then got into West Point. Uh, the Korean War, he was an aide to a general, and he also did work for MacArthur. Um, MacArthur was an overall art, and uh, Hag would put together status maps every day for the reports. The general that uh, Hag worked for had a daughter, and he married the general's daughter. In Vietnam, in 66, he was a lieutenant colonel, a battalion commander, and um, it, he was awarded the Distinguished um, Service Cross, second highest um, decoration for some hairy stuff when his helicopter was shot down. He was in the ground with his troops. And they had a three-day firefight to get out of that battle. Uh, he wound up in the White House working for Richard Nixon as the chief of staff. And um, as you might remember, the Nixon White House was a little uh, house of intrigue. And um, the notes I've read on Hank said he was able to talk Richard as, an, as advising Richard to uh, resign and was instrumental in having him resign. Then he was a NATO commander um, in the rest of the 70s. The lower left picture is Al Hay and Henry Kissinger. Um, he became Reagan's Secretary of State. And some of the, some of the um, Nixonian lessons they learned affected the Reagan White House. Um, Reagan was um, shot in Washington. Uh, George Herbert Walker Bush was in Texas and he was flying home in an airplane when, they, when he found out about the um, shooting. And Hag went to the West Wing and told everybody in the West Wing, the helm is right here, pointing at me, me, Alexander Hag where the um, succession is, is the president, vice president, speaker of the house. And then he goes up and he does a press conference and the first words out of his mouth in the press conference is, I am in control here, which was a little pompous. Um, and that got him into a lot of trouble, made him very controversial. Um, didn't do his long-term um, credit any good, but. Uh, we did get out of that mess, and as you know, Reagan was able to um, survive the shooting and then uh, had the rest of his presidency, uh, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall and all that stuff. So we're awful lucky, but um, Hag was not in control here. Tried a president, presidential run in 1988. I uh, was unsuccessful. Uh, did business and international relations. Uh, worked with media groups. And um, he's buried in Arlington. And he meant well and did uh, good service to his country and um, helped us through a lot of terrible times and did a good job. Alexander Haig. Yeah. Okay, now locally, um, you got bets and we all start getting old. Um, one of our um, Members Pat sent me an email about her dad, Jack Lee, who was in the Seabees in World War II at Normandy. And he was instrumental in building the Mulberry floating docks that were built all along the coast and in Scotland, and then floated across to the Normandy beachhead to create um, landing docks. And he was uh, built Mulberry B. C.T. Alexander, Marine Corps vet, another, yeah, Marine Corps. <laughs> He was in the Mediterranean area during the Cold War. Thanks, CT. Uh, Stan Lieberman, uh, one of our board members. He was in the Air Force 
in England in the 50s. Um, we were laughing stories back and forth about the barracks and how they would have these uh, big number 10 food cans nailed to the um, pillars holding the roof up, painted red for cigarette butts, and they'd have water in them. And Stan said it was so cold the water would freeze. Our own Roger Thorne, 101st Airborne, Vietnam. And then yours, yours truly. Uh, I was in the 4th Infantry Division in Vietnam. Um, so that's, that's kind of um, who we are and the story we have. There we go. Okay, so I mentioned earlier um, about all these different veterans and us older guys, us vets. Um, a lot of us still have our uniforms from our service. And um, there's a fat chance, a real fat chance, that I can ever fit into that. So I, I looked around on the house and I did find one part of my uniform that still fits. There we go. <laughs> and um, just to share this, here's my dog tags. I still have them um, and I treasure them. And um, each one of my grandsons is gonna get one of these when I pass away, um, just to remember me. So to all you vets, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate your service and party on. <laughs> I had no idea, Bart. This was great. And yeah, wasn't it fun? So many people. Yeah, I love I love the nicknames. <laughs> I, I the two I like the most is Nappy and Tui. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tui, come here. Oh. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any questions, we can wrap up. And uh, on behalf of the Tradiferin Public Library and the Tradiferin East Town Historical Society. Thank you to everyone for attending. Uh, we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel. So uh, if you know anybody who missed it and wanted to come or would like to share it, uh, we'd be happy to. And uh, once again, fabulous presentation, Bart. Thank uh, thanks, so Bart. Thanks, everybody.